Welcome back. As Matt said, we're going to talk about federal land issues. We have spent the, the good part of the morning uh, and early afternoon talking about projects, regulations, uh, and drilling down to our questions. And ultimately, they wind up kind of where we are now. What's going on in the poor space? How do we deal with the poor space? Uh, for those of you in this part of the country, um, you have to deal with poor space on a fee basis and a state land basis. If you move to the middle of the country and go out west, you get the pleasure of adding the federal perspective and a tribal perspective. So we're going to have uh, two gentlemen make a presentation, uh, starting at the federal perspective, how the federal government looks at poor space, what that should look like, and then we're going to drill down to how an operator lives and works and deals within that. And we'll start with uh, Michael Hogan. Michael's a realty specialist with the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Interior. He specializes in mineral leasing, act, road right-of-ways, carbon capture, storage and utilization, bonding, and various other rights-of-ways. And he's working to establish a viable CO2 sequestration program. He's got four decades of work at the Bureau of Land Management. And then he'll be followed by Tracy Evans. Tracy is the CEO of Capture Point. He's the former uh, President and Chief Operating Officer of Denbury Resources. He is a petroleum engineer, a professional engineer, and a Sooner, and has an MBA from the University of Dallas, the University of Texas at Dallas. Would you join me in welcoming Mike Hogan? Good afternoon. I'd like uh, to introduce myself, but I've already been introduced. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm Michael Hogan. I'm a realty specialist with uh, the right away branch of headquarters at the Bureau of Land Management, which is a Department of Interior agency. Now, after listening to everybody uh, and all the information that's coming for, and now I get to talk about poor space, I think my mental poor space is just about capped. <laughs> so, you know, we, we have a lot to learn. Uh, the BLM is uh, sort of the new kid on the block uh, when it comes to uh, carbon uh, management issues. Uh, so we don't have all the answers at this moment in time, and in 20 years we still may not have all the answers, but we work daily to try to get to them. Uh, on behalf of the Bureau of Land Management, uh, I'd like to thank Sarah Forbes, uh, Matt Fry, uh, Emma Tomley uh, for all her coordination efforts with me, uh, for inviting our agency to come uh, attend, but uh, personally I'd like to thank them for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about carbon management, uh, federal poor space ownership, and the regulations. Oh, I, oh, all right, I promised myself I wouldn't be the one to continue to uh, uh, do that, but uh, I lost my own bet. Um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, I'd like to, to talk to you about a couple different things. One, poor space is really uh, uh, the, the end result of what we're going to be doing, but how do we get to the poor space and what are you going to need to do? Uh, the Bureau of Land Management has a very robust and wide-ranging uh, right-of-way program, uh, which includes both linear uh, rights-of-ways and site rights-of-ways. Uh, the program uh, plays a significant uh, role in the development of America's renewable energy, wind, solar, and the non-renewable infrastructure, such as highways, um, you know, the co communication sites, and those types of uh, activities. Uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage is a new rule or new role, sorry, uh, for the BLM, uh, trending towards becoming one of uh, the most important and significant climate uh, programs within the Department of Interior. The Bureau of Land Management uh, manages approximately, give or take one or two acres, uh, 245 million acres uh, of land in the western states. Uh, that would include the 11 western states uh, and Alaska. Currently, uh, policy is underway to address poor space, access, evaluation, and management solutions. Uh, poor space is generally considered in the United States to belong 
primarily to the owner of the surface estate. That's been uh, iterated numerous times here as we're uh, going through the, today's uh, education. Uh, so the Bureau of Land Management and the public lands, those 245 million acres, are made up of surface and subsurface estate. So we have a unique perspective as to what is the surface and what's the subsurface estate as far as um, uh, who owns that. Now, naturally, it is our consideration at this moment that unless otherwise judicially changed or legislatively changed, that the surface ownership, uh, the poor space would uh, be the federal if it's federal ownership. Now, one of the things that we have is, uh, depending on that ownership pattern, uh, you may have mixed uh, poor space. And part of the, uh, the lands that we manage, we have what's called the uh, checkerboard square. Okay, the checkerboard square is, uh, was done under the Railroad Act uh, back in the 1800s. And so we have uh, mixed poor space there. We, there are state lands uh, in some parts of the country, like Navajo Nation. We have uh, quite a bit of uh, mixed land ownership that is uh, ran partially uh, managed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs as well as the, uh, the Bureau of Land Management. So poor space is going to be uh, an ongoing and interesting uh, subject as we go forward here. Um, there are, with the public lands, we have 245 million acres, uh, but uh, the lands are divided up into different uses. Uh, and so when you uh, look at uh, what are those uh, uses, we have uh, open areas uh, that we have also restricted and closed areas. Now, a closed area <clears throat> is going to give you legal restrictions uh, to the surface, uh, for the surface state, such as wilderness, monuments, uh, even withdrawals. Uh, the um, military installations, for instance, are all uh, through withdrawals. So uh, we are going to have some areas that are conflicting with the uh, mandated uses that we're doing with them. Uh, we also have resource protection for other areas that are impacted uh, by the development, uh, such as cultural, teeny species, view shed, those types of things to name a few. Now, we have uh, areas of critical environmental concerns, so ACECs, there could be restrictions among uh, the development there. Uh, a lot to still consider. Uh, there is no way that we're going to be able to answer the poor space issue completely here uh, today and discuss that. And uh, we have to look at the fact that additional guidance is going to be required by our agency uh, for uh, poor space access to meet the full-bodied uh, and ambitious goals for by 2050 of a, a trillion metric tons to go underground. God, did it again. Fat fingered it. Okay, as I had mentioned, we have 245 million acres of uh, bureau managed public lands. Uh, right now, a policy has been uh, elevated to uh, the assistant uh, director, uh, and uh, we are in the process of getting that uh, finalized. Now that is going to uh, really pertain to characterization studies. Uh, it's going to uh, uh, deal with how the rights away program is going to authorize those activities. Um, so it's, These policies are just the beginning. We still need to have regulations uh, put in place, but we're hoping that the policies at this point will give us the stopgap measure uh, to be able to uh, move forward uh, with the uh, program. Future policies are gonna provide us with uh, guidance on injection, uh, injection fees, poor space access, values, monitoring, bonding, and these issues uh, directly. So. Uh, we're getting it started, but uh, we're still a ways to go. Now, uh, carbon uh, storage and sequestration projects uh, are still new, and I've mentioned that the regulations and policies are in a uh, quick time trying to get caught up with uh, the, the climate goals of the administration. Back in 2012, uh, the Bureau did look at 
uh, carbon sequestration. And we looked at those to be under what's called Title II, or permitting and leases of uh, the Federal Lands Policy Management Act. Now, we determined this year that it is a solution to use Title II, but the better fit for authorizations of getting uh, the uh, program underway is under rights of way. And so uh, all the activities associated with rights of way are uh, easily confined uh, for a project like uh, this. So let's talk about rights of ways. It's a very robust uh, program at this moment, and it always will be. Uh, rights of ways uh, are determined by using uh, a Title V of the Federal Lands Policy Management Act, and short term rights of ways will be used uh, along that uh, construction periods and so forth and so on. Sorry, I'm. But, did it again. To talk about what the authorization is, let's talk about what the authorization process is not. Uh, we've heard some discussion about the Mineral Leasing Act. Uh, uh, I've heard it uh, through, by the tables. Section 28 of the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920 as amended uh, is uh, what the oil and gas program is uh, authorized under. Uh, The rights of ways that are associated with the Mineral Leasing Act are based on an extraction purpose. Okay? The Mineral Leasing Act was put in place for the extraction of materials, and it is not associated with um, the injection of uh, product into the ground. So we are staying away from the Mineral, the Mineral Leasing Act of uh, 1920. The Federal Lands Policy Management Act of 1976, that is the vehicle in which the authorizations are planned to be uh, taken care of through. Uh, title V is, uh, handles every type of uh, right of way that you can imagine. So managing Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fast. <laughs> uh, a typical uh, Title V, boy, I, okay, I'm sorry. Typical uh, right of ways under uh, Title V are roads, highways, uh, and water pipelines, CO2 pipelines. In this particular instance, we're going to be using the uh, Title V for the characterization studies. Uh, you can have a short term right of way with that. We're going to have roads that are going to be needed into a, an area, pipelines, electric lines potentially, uh, communication or broadband for intercommunication between the, uh, the wells if they're spread out over a long period or a long distance, uh, compressor stations, uh, carbon capture facilities, well sites for injection and monitoring, and a new thing on the block here for us is pore space. Okay, we are going to issue rights of ways for the poor space itself. One of my slides did not make it, so I apologize. Uh, the poor space uh, being uh, a new item, we're still working on things such as bonding. What would that look like for uh, the right of ways that are on the surface is easy, but what's uh, underground, how long would bonding take place? We're going to be working on valuation uh, policies. And uh, these things are coming online. We have right now, uh, if you have any questions uh, for BLM, we've got uh, Steve Fusilier here, uh, the branch chief for rights of ways, as well as uh, Kim Prill, who is the deputy state director from Montana uh, on energy and right of ways. So, we have expertise here in the uh, conference for you to ask questions. I uh, hopefully uh, look forward to uh, having lots of uh, dialogue. And my time is up. No problem. And I'll ask you if you would now welcome Tracy Evans, and we'll talk about how an operator deals with this.
Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I am Tracy Evans, CEO of Capture Point Solutions. Uh, we're basically a combination of a CO2 EOR company, uh, and then we formed a company to actually focus on class six, capturing CO2 from industrial sources and, and moving that CO2 to class six wells. Uh, our two projects today that we have that have been around for, for several years, uh, but they are both now qualified for 45Q and we're, we're closing on those uh, probably in the next month or two. Uh, our overall goal uh, from a CCS perspective is really uh, a concept that we call sequestration as a service. Uh, that's something that I've thought about for probably about the past 15 years uh, when all the CCS uh, talk originally uh, started. Um, and so the idea is that it's very difficult to divvy the, the work up into three phases, the capture, the transportation, and the sequestration. Um, that has been tried for the past 15 years, and to my knowledge, no project has gone forward uh, under that scenario. And so our, our model really is to acquire the CO2, uh, as the early speaker talked about, transport it and sequestrate uh, the sequestration all within uh, one company. Uh, there are some challenges to this. And, and really the, the two things I'm gonna leave y'all with is that um, I really believe it takes an integrated solution. Uh, I think trying to have somebody capture, somebody transport, and somebody um, eventually sequester the CO2, that might happen at some point in time. I don't think that's gonna happen in the near future. Um, one of the other issues that's part of this conversation really is that the largest landowner in the US, which is the federal government, really does not have any set procedures or policies of how do you access their pore space. Uh, I'll talk about two of the projects we're working on a little bit later. Um, but that really is the key, is that for all this to work, uh, you have to access pore space, which several people have, have talked about. Uh, I'm not gonna talk much about it, but we've done CO2ER for probably the last 25, 30 years, most of my team. Uh, we have, as I said, we are capturing carbon, transporting it, and storing it today. Uh, today, we capture about 80 million cubic feet a day of CO2. For you all talking tons, that's about a million and a half tons a year. Uh, from a fertilizer facility at Arcalin, which is in uh, Liberal, Kansas, Coffeyville, which is in Coffeyville, Kansas, from a fertilizer plant, and Levite is a natural gas processing facility that uh, we, we capture CO2 from. We currently operate over 300 miles of dedicated CO2 pipelines, uh, but we've been involved with my predecessor companies uh, with uh, building over 1,000 miles of CO2 pipeline. Today, we have two approved MRV plans uh, at, at both North Burbank unit and at uh, the uh, Farnsworth field where we are capturing and qualifying for 45Q, about a million tons a year between those two projects. And then we also have two other MRV plans in process. Uh, both of those are EOR as well. Um, so what happens? I mean, typically, like at Coffeyville, the CO2 used to just go out the vent stack after the fertilizer company got, got finished with it. Uh, so we, we just redirected that CO2 to our capture facility. There we dehigh it, compress it up to about 1,600 pounds, and put it in our pipeline. Move forward. There we go. Uh, as everybody else has mentioned, most CO2 pipelines today are dedicated. They were built for CO2. The primary reason is most people wanted to uh, put CO2 in the dense phase. You can move about an order of magnitude more CO2 in the dense phase than you can in the gas phase in the same size pipe. So that's the reason why most people would put CO2 in a purpose-built pipeline. Uh, pipelines range around from 1,500 to 2,200. There is one that operates at about 2,600 pounds. Uh, and you can, you can move CO2 lots and lots of miles. Our deal at Coffeeville, we move it about 74 miles to our North Burbank unit where we sequester the CO2 in AR. But depending on the economics, there's nothing that keeps you from moving CO2 hundreds of miles or as you've seen with some of the, the northern projects, even thousands of miles. So where do we store the CO2? Obviously today we're doing an EOR. Uh, most of that's below 5,000 feet. Uh, many, many injection wells. Uh, we have a lot of monitoring compliance around those, those assets. When we go to class six, you're not gonna have as many wells. Uh, you'll have much fewer wells. You'll also have a much less um, information about the reservoir you're going into. I mean, in oil and gas, we have a well every 10 acres, 20 acres, or something like that. And sequestration, 
you know, the sites that we're developing, two to three million tons a year, that'll take somewhere between 15 and 20,000 acres, depending on how thick the actual injection interval is. Well, when you look at that, there may only be four wells that have ever been drilled in that area. I mean, we try to avoid areas where lots of wells have been drilled for obvious reasons of potential leakage pathways. And so when we start to go into carbon storage, uh, I believe we're gonna be 100% successful with it, but it is a different element altogether. And therefore, it takes a lot of time to put the data together before you even get to your class six permit. So what are the challenges? Uh, you, got, you got several challenges today, but most of them are, have to do with how do you make this, this economic arrangement with the emitter? Uh, there's a lot of people that think that there should be a lot of money made in this, in this world, but it really isn't. It really is a product that we just need to get in the ground. Um, and so we work with a lot of different emitters on, on that equation of how do the economics work in this. And one of the, while, while poor space aggregation's on here as well, the, the biggest uh, dis distraction or, or uh, challenge really is the economics of this whole process. You have $50 to deal with, and that has to be broken up into multiple uh, entities. The emitter has to make something, the capture has to make something, the pipeline has to make something, the sequestration guy has to make something, and the guy that you got the core space has to make something from it. And then if you don't have taxable income, the only income stream is a $50 tax credit that you have to monetize. So you can lose an additional about 10% of the value of this whole chain just in the monetization perspective. Um, transport distances, people have talked about this. I really don't think pipelines are the issue. They are one of the higher cost portions of this, but if you have the right volume of CO2, you can transport it uh, over a certain distance. My estimate, rule of thumb, if you want one, is one million cubic feet, you can move a mile economically. If you're trying to move more than a million cubic feet, two miles or three miles, your whole project's probably not gonna be economic. Uh, but ultimately, the issue is the poor space aggregation. As several people have talked about, these are gonna be very, very large sites. How do you aggregate them? Some states have some unitization rules in effect. Others call it expropriation, some call it aggregation. But for the most part, most of the US does not allow this. For instance, Texas does not have any sort of unitization uh, ability at all, other than 100% approval. Now, you've had lots of federal guys talk about it. This is U.S. Department of Energy. Again, going back to somewhat the beginning of this in 2009, all of this talk about using federal acreage, all this talk about, you know, looking at private ownership and all that, we've talked about this for over 10 years now. And really not much has happened in terms of getting uh, poor space uh, processes uh, in place to be able to aggregate it. You know, there's, there's another article here, if it'll move, in 2000 in 2020, or this is actually relatively new, about a new multi-billion dollar being available to kickstart CO2 removal. There's nothing in this document that says anything about how do we get aggregate pore space? Uh, how, how do we encourage states to figure out ways to, to do pore space? And so when, when you get down to the end, federal and state lands will be, they're the biggest landowners. Uh, we would hope that they would be able to uh, actually figure out ways to put processes in place, you know, Louisiana has now done some, some state land leasings, as you heard from their, the Air Products Group. Uh, but federal lands so far have really not, that we've seen, been able to get any, any pore space. We have two test cases we're working on now. One's in the National Forest Service, uh, where we actually have some state lands that we, we have under lease that actually sits and it's surrounded by natural forests. And so we can actually bring the pipeline in onto the state lands, have our injection wells on the state land, but the plume will go out under the National Forest, and we're still not getting very good reception from the National Forest Service on this. Uh, the other area we looked at is the Department of Defense, military base, uh, and so whether it's the Department of Agriculture, which controls the National Forest, whether it's the Department of Defense that does the military bases or the Bureau of Interior uh, that controls a lot of other lands, we really need to figure out how we can use these U.S. lands, and there are ways to do it without impacting the surface. In some cases, we just need the, uh, the availability of the pore space for the plume or the pressure uh, to go over that. So going forward, we're gonna continue to work on this. We'd encourage everybody in this room to help us with this. Uh, we need to talk, have more engagement at probably the federal level with some of these different uh, federal agencies, but this will be a critical aspect to getting CO2 sequestration done in the US. Thank you.
Yep. So we have time for some questions from the audience. I see a hand up in the back. We have a microphone moving. Hi. Uh, the first question I have, I'd like to send it to Tracy Evans. Tracy, the one of the comments you made was that you thought that sort of a sole provider, the owner of the whole process, could make a project go forward under the current 45Q credits. Is that what I heard from your comments? It is, and it, but that, I'll, I'll caveat that a little bit with the fact that that's pure source CO2. So CO2 that's come out from a fertilizer plant, you know, they had to already separate the CO2 from the hydrogen to make their fertilizer. And so if they can deliver you pure CO2, Great. we can capture it, we can transport it, and we can uh, sequester it. Uh, can I ask another one? Sure. You have the mic, you have the control so, right now. It, you were talking about federal lands, and I, there's two parts to this question. The first one is, if you were dealing with federal lands, how serious do you see the NEPA study in that part? The second part of the question is, if you're uh, looking for the government to help you access federal land, can you, and I, this is for the panel, can you tell me what you think, one thing the federal government can do to make that access to well, from the NEPA standpoint, uh, you know, really what we're trying to do is, is access federal lands subsurface-wise, not necessarily on the surface. Uh, and so NEPA typically covers just surface impacts. Uh, not sure it's been expanded to subsurface yet, but, you know, that remains to be seen as the federal government goes through, you know, looking at how they're going to do pore space. Um, you know, there is a, in the oil and gas world, we had a categorical exclusion that if we impacted less than five acres, we could be exempted from NEPA. Uh, and so most of the projects we're looking at, we are gonna try to do that. And again, we're not necessarily going to the federal lands um, unless there is a, they have a large land mass that can, that can hold the whole thing. Uh, our other one that's state and federal, that one 100% of our activity will be on state lands. Uh, only the plume and the pressure front will go onto the national forest. Uh, the BLM, uh, NEPA is going to, like uh, Tracy had uh, stated, is uh, dealing with uh, the surface at this point, surface impacts, cultural t &E species, uh, you know, view sheds, uh, ownership, uh, pat uh, not necessarily ownership, but use patterns such as uh, recreation and that type of thing. So uh, you know, NEPA is going to give us the determination as far as uh, what the surface uh, restrictions could be uh, on the authorizations. Uh, we're not that I anticipate seeing anything uh, with the subsurface, uh, you know, the pore space. It's really be hard to evaluate that beyond characterization studies and, <laughs> and determining it. But yeah, well, it's, uh, who wants to go 5,000 feet under the earth to see what's there? Uh, so uh, we're not uh, looking uh, too much along that line. But there will be, if directional drilling is going to be used and the pore space is going to be accessed, whether or not it is uh, accessed from off-site and directionally drilled, or if it's on BLM, for instance, for service is a little different, but if it's on BLM, I, I anticipate that there will still be injection fees and poor space values that are going to have to uh, be dealt with uh, through that process. That is still one of those up in the air things. We need to have uh, uh, appraisals and valuation studies done to determine that. If you have a question, raise your hand and we'll move the mic. And yeah. while we're, there's one in the back and whilst they're moving the microphone, I'm going to take advantage. Michael, you talked about this is new, the new process for access and valuation. Um, the obvious question in the room is how long? You've said it's been <coughs> elevated to uh, assistant deputy. Uh, give us your best guess as to how long we're talking. Well, the initial uh, policy uh, that uh, we're writing uh, that brings us under the uh, right-of-way umbrella, uh, I, I'm anticipating and hoping for in the next uh, 30 days maybe it would be uh, completed and signed off. Uh, it might be a little generous for me to say that, but uh, you know I have my dreams. Uh, but um, uh, I, I, the policies as far as values and that we still have to have appraisals done and so 
uh, how we do the appraisals uh, for pore space and injection fees, uh, we're still working with uh, AVSO, our, our uh, appraisal and valuation service, to come up with criteria. It's one of the reasons why I asked Wyoming how they came up with their uh, value. Thank you. Question in the back. facilitating leading it and I'm like, all right, so I'm gonna change the agenda because none of you people want to talk about methane mitigation. <laughs> yeah, um, we, we finished an hour early. Thank you. I'm gonna advance that, uh, Tracy, to you. As an operator who's trying to function in that space, uh, you've indicated that we don't have any federal guidance yet. So what allows you to go forward? What, what gives you the confidence other than a big giant risk to talk with the Forest Service, to talk with DOD, um, to talk to us a minute about it as an operator, your willingness or lack thereof to do that. No, we, we, we uh, have I'm, the willingness to do it. We're, we're trying it on why, two, two sites, well, actually three sites fine. right now. I'm not good. Uh, the engagement has been uh, we need to answer the questions. It's a lot easier. at best minimal. Uh, it's been really difficult to find the right people, especially in the Department of Agriculture. And when you say right people, do you mean yeah. in the I Forest think, Service said, that understand right. CCUS the program and in, say it's well, and in federal lands it's who understand the technology, or is it a different issue? I'm going to hype issue? you guys up. All the above. Okay. Uh, it's really hard just to find that right first person. <laughs> uh, in one case, we have found a person who seems to take some initiative <laughs> and want to advance it. So in that case, well, we do have some hope that that will move forward. But he's not at a very high level either. So it's, you know, we, we have I can do either. people that have worked in a lot of different federal agencies trying to help us out, yes. and they're finding this to be very, very difficult. Understood. But it, it has to be done, so we're willing to spend the time and, and effort to, tr to try to make it happen. Wonderful. Final question in the back. Man, I thought they'd be tired out of questions by now. Yeah. Kind of that, uh, I've seen you just have the strategy right away and headquarters with the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, our policy will specifically address the issue of leasing the poor space or sequestration. So uh, that, that's coming very quickly and it will be available uh, on the BLM very shortly. It's working well with Montana and Wyoming where the projects uh, that we have applications on are now and we we'll talked with other of our states Projects that they've been in conversations with. So, on Bureau of Land Management side, I think they'll be pleased with the fact that that policy is coming out very quickly. That would be great. Much appreciated. In fact, I just got through on Tuesday morning. Hello, Louisiana. Here, dealing with editing just a couple of paragraphs for our assistant secretary, that our assistant secretary has some questions. So, that's a high priority. Very close. A wishful 30 days is much better than a wishful 30 months, <laughs> any day. Yeah. Would you join me in thanking our panel That's for the discussion? Awesome. <laughs> that is such a nice day. One little comment, if uh, Ms. Evans, if you'd like to talk to me, I can get you some contact in Forest Service because uh, BLM and Forest Service try to coordinate a lot of things, and so we've actually been in discussion that with them. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you one more time, panel. Thank you. While we're waiting for our next panelist to arrive, we're going to change gears. We have, whether we've done it overtly or covertly, we've spent most of the day talking about CCUS and probably not saying it, but meaning onshore. 
and we're going to take a hard left turn and go offshore with this panel. Um, I, I don't need to frighten Jill, but I'm probably going to because we're going to very quickly go off script. Um, yeah, two of has, our three presenters yeah, are storytellers. It's kind of, it's kind of we want to have a conversation. I'm going to think about so it. So we have one set of slides. About that. What we'd like about to do this. is to have them and you have a conversation. So it can be as interactive as possible. So I'm going to, I'm going to do my best. If you, in the middle of their conversation, if you have something that's important, raise your hand. We'll try and get you in. We have time at the end for questions. But they've asked if we could be as interactive and have a discussion with you as opposed to make presentations so to you. So our plan of attack is to talk about the policy uh, and regulations. And Kayla Dolan, uh, who's the manager of policy and strategy at Adamantine Energy, is going to talk to us about that. Um, she guides clients through changing legislative, regulatory, political uh, environments to mitigate risks, especially those facing oil and gas entities. She spent time on the Hill uh, serving in both the Senate and the House, and most recently uh, served as a policy advisor to Senator Bill Cassidy. After we finish um, with Kayla, we're going to change gears. Always helpful if you have the information. Uh, to Michael Salata. Uh, Michael's with the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, or BOEM, for those of you that know BOEM, uh, out of the New Orleans Regional Office. Um, he leads BOEM's uh, regulatory oversight resource management for offshore energy and marine. He's been with BOEM for more than 30 years. Uh, he's a geophysicist with degrees from Bowdoin and Boston College. And he's going to drill down a little bit and talk about what the federal government's doing from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, if you're unaware, um, they're similar to BLM are on a fast track to, to put some regulations in place. And then we get to finish up with the best storyteller of them all, Jason Lanklow who's the director of the State Energy Office, the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources. Uh, he's a professional engineer, uh, having served as the deputy executive director of the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. He took the opportunity to go back to LDNR and serves as the director of the State Energy Office and is currently serving as the Louisiana Coalition representative for the state and Midwest region on carbon capture utilization and storage technologies and executive board of the National Energy uh, National Association of State Energy Officers. So if you'll in, indulge me for a moment, we're going to embark on a conversation and story with Kayla. <laughs> Do you want me to sit you or stand? You can stand, you can sit, I'll stay out of your way. Yeah, if whatever you think. Okay, well, I'll, I'll sit. So thank you everyone this afternoon for this wonderful Thanks, conversation. Um, it's been exciting to be back in the policy world. I left the Hill about a year ago and to dive into all the carbon management stories and presentations has been awesome. Um, so I just want to kick off by saying that when I was working for Senator Cassidy, this issue about offshore sequestration, how we were going to do it, are there potential projects, really came about at the end of 2018, early 2019. And if you had told me back then that we'd be sitting here really turning a vision into action, I probably would have laughed because when I went to folks to say, hey, I think this is a problem, how are we going to do it? Folks would say, yeah, this is like seven or eight on our priority list, so come back in a couple of years. And this really is an effort of um, folks in industry, Jason and others, coming together and say, we need to have a proactive plan because we know we need offshore sequestration. Everyone has seen the charts today of the CO2 pipelines, the CO2 potential, and where we need to store it. So we know we need some offshore sequestration. So I was really excited when the Infrastructure Act was able to clarify some outstanding questions in the policy realm that now Mike and Jason have to answer and figure out um, actually how to get it regulated and how to get projects off the ground. But really, the two main issues that we're dealing with when it comes to offshore sequestration is who has the authority and some environmental issues around permitting for offshore if any of the um, Marine Research and Sanctuary Act permits are going to be triggered. And it really is an effort to Senator Cassidy, who really dug into the policy and was able to get the infrastructure bill through that said, DOI, you have the authority um, to permit offshore sequestration, and was able to waive or to clarify some of the environmental issues. So now that the policy is in place, moving forward to what is the next steps? How do we get projects off the ground? How do we get um, the vision into a reality? And so what I think about now, switching caps into my role in Adamantine, is how to really create um, this idea of consensus and how to work through some of these issues that Jason and Mike are going to talk about. And so thinking about the particular issue of creating conditions for success and for consensus, when we think about the challenges that they're going to talk about, about offshore sequestration with liability, 
with permitting, with some of the other legal structures. It really is going back to this idea that came out in the end of 2018 and 2019, from my perspective, of long-term proactive planning and bringing diverse stakeholders to the table. Um, my boss recently said, you know, the oil and gas industry is the rocket science of subsurface. And so I really take that to heart when we're talking about how are we going to get offshore sequestration projects off the ground? How are we going to pipe CO2 offshore? Where are we going to capture? It's really bringing these folks to the table to talk through some of these liability issues. And then the second piece of it, uh, which I am really excited about, especially when you see the maps of the carbon sequestration potential, is these unconventional partnerships. We're seeing it with some of the projects that have been announced in Texas and other parts of the Gulf, is really bringing together great minds from the oil and gas industry, from the industrial sector. We talked about cement a lot today and other sources, but really bringing those to the table early on to have this proactive planning session of what's needed. What are the ideas to kind of work through some of these tough issues that Jason and Mike are going to have to deal with? Because really um, having all those voices, I think, is going to be really important. And so when it comes to the policy, when it comes to the regulation, my whole stigma when I was on the Hill um, was bring me the data. Bring me what do you need to get things done. And so in my current role, I also talk a lot about that, is bringing policymakers bringing regulators ideas and innovative solutions, because really that's the only way to get this done. Um, and again, going back to when I first started about folks saying, this is seven or eight on our priority list, um, it's really come to the forefront of the attention. And when you talk about proactive planning, there's the long term of where we need to be in 2050, but the short and medium term are where we have to be in 2030, 2040, 2045. And we know that these projects offshore are going to get off the ground. We're hopeful they're going to get off the ground. But the way to do it is to really bring the ideas to this diverse group of table um, of stakeholders and say, this is what we really need. Um, and being here in Louisville talking about regional consensus and developing regional hubs, you know, you look especially in the Gulf with the hydrogen hubs. You can bring ports to the table. You can bring uh, the petrochemical sector to the table. So I'm personally, if you can't tell, just really excited that this is actually happening, that we're close, um, and to hear from Jason and Mike about what they foresee as the next steps in getting these regulations promulgated and more of these projects off the ground. Awesome. Thank you, Kayla. you please join me in welcoming Mike Salata to the, you, gotta, you wanna try and do it from there? Um, You're I welcome to come here or you can stay there. I will try from right see, here. Technology will allow that to I thought you weren't gonna let me do the slides so this no, is even better. Gonna, I thought you would really call it an audible. So um, uh, yeah, I, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, usually I get to stick to coastal states because we are in the federal offshore. And so I appreciate the opportunity to come here and uh, see Louisville and participate in this conference. I'm Mike Salata. I'm the Regional Director for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Gulf of Mexico Regional Office. Um, and Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is in, within the Department of Interior. Um, and I'm quickly going to touch on where our authority came from. Apparently, Senator Cassidy and, and others uh, helped develop the, our authority. And uh, talk about carbon sequestration. Um, overview, but I'm going to concentrate on the Gulf of Mexico. I think that's the greatest opportunity in the offshore, and um, we'll show some maps around the potential there as well. And I think it's important, and I, I think I hit the button again. I think it's important to understand what Bureau of Ocean Energy Management's mission is, and it's energy development in the federal OCS offshore. And uh, historically, that's been oil and gas. And uh, about, say, 15% of the oil produced in the United States comes from the offshore, and 98% of that comes from the Gulf of Mexico. And so really, when we're implementing uh, our new authority, uh, that experience is, kinda, is critical in our success moving forward. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And so uh, the authority came from the bipartisan infrastructure law, and it gave us very similar authorities that we have for oil and gas, so leasing, our right of use and easements, right of ways, and uh, we had a year deadline to in get those regulations promulgated. It's probably not going to happen in a year, and I'll just say that up front. Uh, we're hoping to get a draft rule out here by the end of the year, and then maybe follow that up pretty quickly with the final rule. Um, it is an extensive rule, 
It's going to be a, both a BOEM and a BSEE, uh, Sister Agency, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement rule. And so with uh, oil and gas, it's taken years to develop those regs, um, but we're going to put together pretty quickly here some rules for, for carbon sequestration. And what you see here is a map of the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, just to talk about that in general, is, uh, it's divided into three planning areas, the western, central, and eastern. Uh, you can see the green there. Those are the oil and gas leases. So I want to talk about the leasing process for the oil and gas just a bit because I think that plays into how we're going to do carbon sequestration or it, it leads into what questions we need to answer that appropriately allow us to implement the regulations uh, for carbon sequestration. So for oil and gas, you identify an area where you want to have leasing. And so in the Gulf, it's generally been the western and central planning area. And then we lease three mile by three mile blocks. Right? And a company bids a bonus, what they think that's worth, net present value of, of the future value. And we have some terms and conditions, um, rental rates, royalty rates. Um, and from there, once we award the lease, BOEM actually looks at the subsurface. We do an analysis of our own and come up with what that value is. So we have an extensive database of data and information and, and geoscientists and engineers who have great experience in looking at the subsurface of the Gulf of Mexico. And then from there, a company implements a plan. In that plan, we do our environmental reviews, but this lays out the project through decommissioning of what they plan to do, and we look at that. At that point, and, and actually for an exploration plan, BOEM reviews that within 30 days. We have 30 days to do that. It's a quick turnaround. We don't take a long time. I think we have uh, 60 days for a development plan. So we're good at producing and, and developing those plans and do our, our deeper analysis in that process. At that point, so when you all talk about permits, permits is a BSEE purview. So if you have an application to drill, BSEE deals with the permits, and then they will look at safety, they will look at inspections. So that's how the process unfolds um, for oil and gas. And so we're looking at this detailed, comprehensive rulemaking, BOEM and BSEE, uh, given a year. And these are all the areas that we need to have discussions around, right? Financial assurance, environmental considerations, all those things I just talked about, leasing, plans, liability. So BOEM also does renewable energy offshore, mostly on the Atlantic, headed to the Pacific, and in the Gulf, we hope we have a renewable energy auction early in 2023. Um, but the leasing process is somewhat different. So instead of a three mile by three mile block, which, what do you have? We have maybe 80,000 acres that gets put together in a project that needs to be the appropriate scale to generate one to one and a half gigawatts of energy. For oil and gas, you generate, uh, actually have authority once you get that lease to go out and drill and explore. But with renewables, your authority only gives you the authority to submit a plan. That, then that plan has to be reviewed. So which one of those scenarios is gonna happen for carbon sequestration? My guess is you're gonna need to only get the ability to submit a plan, right? Because there's a lot that goes on with that. What's the scale? Uh, what's the uh, model that exists? Uh, so but those are the things that we're doing and why it's probably going to take a little bit longer for us to do that. Okay. And one of the things that's important for us in this process and why we think that once we have the rule, that we'll be in position to take on projects is we're doing a lot of extensive outreach. So we're working with states who already have experience. Uh, we're working with other federal partners. We've worked with foreign nations who have already done this. One of the things when you talk to foreign countries is liability, right? In those cases, once the plume is stable, those countries take on the liability in the European Union. Is that something that's going to happen here in the United States? That's a good question because for oil and gas, we've never taken on liability for any properties. That liability remains with the predecessor, uh, the person who's drilled that well, or even if you do rigs to reefs, then the states take on that liability. So those are some important questions that we have to answer when the draft rule comes out in November. Those are things that folks might want to comment on as we move forward. And so let's talk about the Gulf of Mexico. So what's the potential? It's great. I, I, we, we're in the process of trying to understand that. Uh, it's, it, it is a prolific geologic basin. All the subsurface things that you need are there in place to store carbon, right? And we've looked at both depleted and saline reservoirs uh, already. Um, as a matter of fact, we're in the process of um, 
uh, working on an assessment of, of the subsurface that hopefully will be done in two years. So if we do a rule any uh, draft rule in a year and the final rule's out in say two, we'll be ready to go. We'll have assessed the subsurface, we'll know its capacity, we'll know where that capacity exists, and those projects should then hopefully move through the process fairly quickly at that point. And so this just shows you, we did some quick analysis on 100 of the largest producing reservoirs, and we high graded 21 reservoirs in nine fields that we think are clearly appropriate already for carbon sequestration. And you can see the circles there, and there's a size scale, so when you get the presentation in detail, you can, can look at that in a little more detail. And then this is just a published study of uh, saline reservoirs and the capacity. Um, there, there is a lot of capacity, but we're doing our own analysis. Um, as I said, there's, we have like 3,000 G&G 3D surveys in the Gulf of Mexico from oil and gas and 50,000 boreholes to do our end well logs associated with that so that we can do this analysis. And so in summary, uh, uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the other OCS areas are <coughs> poised to play a significant role. Um, in the nation's mission to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the, the geology uh, in the Gulf of Mexico is ideal for this. And I could go on for that for a long time. And um, if you want to come to my office, we can show you all that stuff as well. Um, there's, I think the depleted or whatever reservoir you're interested, we, we can find a way to manage that. We can find that at the appropriate scale. Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges for us in the future is multi-use in the Gulf, uh, making sure that we can accommodate uh, carbon sequestration, wind energy, oil and gas. I mean, it is an energy basin. It will continue to be an energy basin. I think one of our goals is to make it a clean energy basin as we move forward and certainly don't have time to talk about hydrogen generation, but a lot of people have talked <laughs> about that and that's an opportunity in the Gulf of Mexico as well. And um, hopefully Bo and Bessie can get our regs together in the near future and then the projects can commence in the Gulf of Mexico. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. And please welcome our final uh, presenter, Jason Linklow. Good afternoon. I'm going to stand up and break the mold a little bit, so uh, I just need to stretch my legs. So th thanks so much for, for being here today. And I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about and follow up with Kayla and Mike just about why the Gulf of Mexico is so important and why we see such tremendous potential. But in order to do that, I want to paint a little bit of a picture as to why Louisiana is looking at this and, and really what that role plays in terms of offshore sequestration. I was really hoping Kenya would be here because she gave a checklist this morning of homework. Last time I was in Louisville for Southern States Energy Board, I think I hit four of the six things that she talked about this morning. We had, a, uh, we had the, heart, the Kentucky Derby Museum, which they did a, a live or kind of a mock horse race, which was fantastic, bourbon. The Muhammad Ali Museum, I bought my son a bat from Louisville Slugger. And obviously the bourbon is always fantastic. So one of my favorite cities to visit. And it's so nice to, I know that Patrice wishes, I did speak to her earlier in the week and, and we greatly appreciate these folks for putting on this meeting. So um, sequestration and carbon capture in general in Louisiana. When we, when we look at where we're going in terms of where we are now and where we're going in the future, offshore sequestration is, is number one priority for us in terms of that tier two approach. So we look at everything kind of in tiers and sequestration. But I want to give you kind of maybe some perspective as to where we are now to, in terms of why sequestration offshore is important. So Louisiana, we talked to uh, states this morning, the presentations from Wyoming and, and West Virginia and, and North Dakota, y'all are blazing a trail and we hope that we are as well. States have a tremendous opportunity with doing and setting up a, a really robust permitting system and really looking at a lot of the liability issues. And we've been very proactive. We've been working very closely with Bill and his team and at EPA in their region. They've been fantastic in bringing all this together. Uh, Louisiana embarked on a very aggressive climate plan, which you're asking, so the Gulf Coast states, who else has a climate plan? We were one of the first states to do that. Um, not the most uh, easy meeting to go to when you look at all these diverse stakeholders, but I will tell you, and I'm here today to tell you, that those conversations when you sit down with in terms of long-term management of CO2, it brings a lot of diverse opinions together, and it also gives you some really a mindset in terms of how to approach them as a regulator and as a policymaker to say that how can we manage this. So Louisiana in general has about 200 million metric tons per year 
of CO2 that we have to deal with. That's very unique in the sense that we're very similar only to Texas, that 62 to 65 percent of those emissions come from industrial sources. So we have tremendous manufacturing capabilities, oil and gas, we have a lot of refineries, we have about a fifth of the nation's refining capacity. All those are very, very high producing, high CO2 output types of industries. They're essential for world products. Obviously, we ship products all over the world, LNG opportunities as well. So we, we're big producers of products and we're big shippers of products. So very high intense industries, but they're also located very close together in the industrial corridors, both in the New Orleans area and in Western Louisiana. So what that does for us is it gives us an opportunity to, to really start to look at collaborating resources, both on capturing CO2 and also on infrastructure. So you saw the spaghetti models. We have pipeline density that's pretty much second to none. So we already have existing CO2 lines. Matt talked about their existing hydrogen line. So we're looking at a long-term strategy for CO2 management across the state. And what that means is how can we get folks who are high emitters to look at bringing hydrogen in and taking carbon dioxide out. So that, that involves a strategy to look at long-term management of CO2, which the state has been very proactive about. My counterpart at, at DNR, a guy named Blake Canfield, has really led that effort to look at long-term liability. When you look at EPA, their, their number right now for liability is 50 years. We, we had a law that was passed in 2009 that set the stage to start to look at that process, to develop rules, to look at long-term poor space ownership. So we brought together this community of folks all looking at poor space ownerships. We did a series of about eight public meetings where we brought in industry, we brought in NGOs, we looked at stakeholders, community engagement, and really started to, uh, to really work through what those liabilities looked like. So I'm very happy to report to you that after a really robust conversation that we, our, our, our folks in our legal department developed a, a set of uh, guidelines and rules, and um, we're very happy to report that we have two of the probably the, the largest poor space, poor space ownership agreements that were signed in Louisiana. First of their kind, something that attorneys don't like to do because we're an energy state and we've done a lot of agreements, but we've never done agreements for CO2. So, so Matt and his team and also the Grown Fuels folks had to really blaze a trail and say that, hey, look, we're going to do this. We need to do it. And they came up with a system that we're very proud of and we have some leases that are on state lands. And the reason why we're so proud of that is that right now, when you look at that tiered approach that I talked about earlier, the state lands give you an opportunity to have one landowner, which is the state of Louisiana, that has a liability program, that has guidelines on how we're going to handle long-term management, and really give someone who's coming in to do a long-term project some certainty for those investments, which we're not talking about small investments, we're talking about billions of investments that are coming into our state specifically on carbon management. Their facility was about $5 billion. We're looking at potentially anywhere from another 10 to 15 potential projects all with three to four injection wells. So we're talking in a country where we permitted on paper six wells to date at EPA, just all of class six, two of those being active in Illinois. We're talking about just in Louisiana potentially having 40 to 50 permits in the next three to five years. So that's a very intimidating number given that EPA has this great group of folks, but they don't have enough of them. Same thing when you look at all around the country, a lot of programs are vastly understaffed and we absolutely have to dedicate more resources. This particular group over the last three years has been instrumental in working with EPA and making sure that we're, we're dedicated to looking for additional appropriations. You saw some things passed in the Infrastructure Act that's bringing together additional grant fundings that EPA is offering for states that want to pursue primacy. These things are extremely important because for us, we have a staff of 40 folks who are working in our Office of Conservation. We have folks who are dedicated to carbon management that we've hired. So we have a, an additional staff of eight that we've added in the last two years that are just focused on doing and reviewing permits when it relates to carbon management. So that's super exciting. So that tier one approach for on-land resources for CO2 and poor space, we have unprecedented access and unprecedented interest from companies all over the world who are looking at doing projects in Louisiana, we fully anticipate that that poor space in Louisiana is, is at, we already know that it's at a premium and it's going to, at a point, get to a point where we have to start looking for other opportunities and other areas to put that to CO2. The studies that we've seen that this group's put together that Jeff and Dane and others have worked on have illustrated that the Gulf Coast has somewhere from 50 to 100 years of storage potential for carbon dioxide. That is an astronomical number and we're talking about all the country's emissions, not just our emissions or, or Texas's emissions. So the Gulf Coast plays this just dynamic astronomical role in terms of offshore sequestration. 
when we looked at this three years ago, we fully recognized and went to Kayla and Senator Cassidy and other folks in our congressional delegation, and we said, guys, if there is not a plan and a process to put, thing, put carbon dioxide offshore and we don't work through some of these hurdles, we're going to get to a point where that single landowner and private landowners, we're going to run out of room. So how can we start to think through and make sure that we're ready to, to deal with that next phase of projects? So what we're starting to see is that there, that there is momentum, obviously, at the policy level, but this is going to take significant investment. It's going to take infrastructure, and it's going to take a lot of policies to make sure that the federal agencies are coordinating and working together to make sure that we have a very clear plan for offshore sequestration. So we feel uh, with Mike and his team and Bohm and the Interior and all the folks that we're talking to that there is a plan and that, that we're excited about it. The challenge for us, as in other Gulf Coast states, is that we have what's called a working coast. So we have this tremendous um, infrastructure of all these major energy companies who are operating deep in onshore platforms. We have other folks who are doing other types of infrastructure work out there. We're in the midst of trying to develop a very robust offshore wind community. So all these things are coming together and you, on top of that, start to put in carbon sequestration in these depleted reservoirs. So this is going to be a busy time and a busy area that we fully anticipate is going to keep a lot of folks very busy on the liability and on the permitting standpoint. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're ready, that we do it the right way, and that these projects are done safely. So offshore storage, when we start to look at this, this isn't just for Louisiana. This is an option for, I think, all these different companies who are looking at decarbonizing across the entire Gulf Coast. We need to make sure that core space has every bit of attention that we can possibly give it. And I think that for us, we've dedicated a lot of time and resources to make sure that the state has a very clear program and a path to do that. And we're going to continue to work with BOEM and our other federal partners to make sure that as we go forward, that these projects can start to get off the ground. And all the federal infrastructure acts that are in place right now, when we get to that point, I think things like RISE and the things like SCALE that are trying to support infrastructure, those are going to be key bills in trying to move to that next level when we start to look at projects. So, that three to five year plan becomes even more and more important. So anything that you can do at the state level to make sure that your state legislators are aware that, hey, look, these things are happening, that these federal bills are supporting a certain type of uh, project, these things are gonna be instrumental for long-term decarbonization. And I think that for us, when you have a state that's very carbon intensive, we have to look at any and all available infrastructure to try to make those things happen. So it's been uh, fantastic to, to be with all of you today. Look forward to, to answering questions. So thanks very much. Thank you, Jason. Um, if you have a question, we'll move the mics around. And as that's happening, I'm going to, as we, as we open this session, we started with Kayla at the federal policy level and moved to the federal agency and then down to the state level. I'm going to back my way out and go to the state level first and say, Jason, if nothing changed today, it's just the way it is, you as a state and you as a state who have operators that come to you and say, I want to do this in the Gulf Coast, what's missing, what's needed? What are you hearing from them or the state that needs to happen? So, so great question, Steve. So for us, we have jurisdiction three miles out. So our, our state waters are three miles. We, we currently could probably permit a lease in the offshore Gulf of Mexico and within the three miles. Anything past that three mile corridor, Mike and his team and obviously the other federal agencies, when we looked at this, as I alluded to earlier, there's not necessarily what I would consider kind of a, a lead federal permitting agency that is going to be a single stop shop that you could go to and say, how do I get an offshore sequestration lease? What data do I need? What do we have to provide? So we, we are very much looking at a, a basically something that can really bridge what is the coordination role? What does that federal agency structure look like? And what does a company who wants to pursue a project what exactly does that process look like? So I think that that's what Mike and his team, they're doing the analysis, they're looking at storage potential, but we're gonna to have to have that federal permitting coordination role to make sure that a company has clear understanding of what it takes in order to be able to inject carbon dioxide in federal waters. Awesome, so Michael, coming back to the feds, and I don't wanna confuse my Michaels, but I wanna ask this question. Michael Hogan talked about federal poor space ownership. In the Outer Continental Shelf, does that still lie? Do we wait for BLM to finish that? Do you have any jurisdiction to talk about the federal poor space as you're looking at your rules and regs? Uh, and then after you answer that, I have one more follow-up. Well, I think in the federal OCS, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, the, actually, the, the, the poor space in the land all belongs to the American people, and Bohm and Bessie are stewards of that. So there, there is no, that is what our leasing process is. 
um, once if you have a lease that gives you access to the core space. So I'm going to interrupt and say, does that mean that we could have a different set of how we evaluate the pore space in the Outer Continental Shelf versus onshore? I think we have, uh, I think that is a potential process. Uh, you know, we have different processes now. Um, we do uh, coordinate closely with BLM through the Assistant Secretary's office. And uh, we try, I would say, to keep processes similar so that uh, companies can come in and they understand the process moving forward. But there are different unique areas uh, that may be different and and the rules may be slightly different um you're obviously working in a marine environment as opposed yeah to in, the, in the marine yeah. environment i i think you know we we had clearly have uh, uh, processes that have defined terms in the past we've had 30 days to do exploration plans 60 days for development plans um uh, you know i'm not sure what blm's regulations are there and that um, I, I would say challenge you to know those just whether there's a differentiation between. Yeah, those I, two I think you know there may be differences, okay. but I think we would uh, try to minimize those differences as much as possible. Um, and I would say that if you're looking for coordination in, in the Gulf of Mexico, we, everyone you can contact me, and we we can be that coordinating bodies. I do think BOEM does an effective job at doing that coordination, and a lot of that is through our NEPA analysis, where we bring in all the coordinating agencies. And, and interestingly enough, on oil and gas, I mean BOEM has air quality jurisdiction in the western and central planning areas, and not EPA. But we the EPA does have it in the eastern, so we all have to work together to try to figure out how those processes work together. Wow. Appreciate that. So now we're coming back to the policy piece where you said when you were in Congress, you would always tell those folks that you work for, bring me the technical answers, bring me the issues, tell me how to solve the problem. After what you've heard today, are there technical problems that need to be solved? Are they solely policy issues? What are the issues that we need to address going forward? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think on the technical piece, you know, we've heard throughout the day that there's still research on CCS and hydrogen, and I think the Infrastructure Act and the Energy Act are really doing a good job of helping to accelerate that research. And then so I think what Jason was getting at on the flip side of it is really having um, a central agency or, or a central um, partnership where folks can go to help streamline the permitting processes streamlining getting projects off the ground where folks can go and say hey i have this innovative solution to you know piping co2 you know leveraging current infrastructure retrofitting but right now um it just it's a it's, it's a hodgepodge so i think it's with the advancement of the r d and the money as well as finding a solution to have um almost like a clearinghouse to be able to get all this data and information together Thank you. Can, can I Please. add into that? Because uh, I think in our renewable energy process uh, that is happening, and I think that is something that we can learn from. So there's this, I, I don't know what the initial, it's FIPSI, mm -hmm. and they're a project, they, they coordinate projects um, at that level, and their goal is to try to help do that coordination. So I do think uh, there are lessons we can learn from the renewal process that we can apply to, to this uh, moving forward. Wonderful. Audience question. There's a hand in the back. Thank you. Um, Kristen Grane with Intergy. Kayla, it's great to see you. Um, big thanks to your boss for IIJA um, and him getting that over the finish line. Um, I know it's really important to our company and a lot of others um, throughout the country. Um, I just had a question kind of related to um, you know, offshore, offshore storage and um, the hydrogen hub um, grants through IIJA. Um, that's on a five-year timeline, I believe, right now, and it'll likely stretch out further from what we understand. And you know, in the conversations this morning, talking about blue hydrogen, the blue hydrogen project in Louisiana that does have the CCS component, can you talk a little bit about the strategy or the timelines for um, you know, how long it's gonna take to get uh, the, the rulemaking done or, you know, permitting done for offshore storage and, you know, how that might affect those hydrogen hub applications. You know, I know that there's a lot of industry in our area that is very interested in um, those hydrogen hubs, and I know that we already have projects being started there. So how does that kind of um, work, I think, moving forward? Sorry if that's a tough one, I or for anyone that wants to answer it. You want to take that one? You start and then I'll. 
Yeah. So uh, I think that what, what Mike was, was, so Senator Cassidy and IIJA kind of set the groundwork for that agency coordination that we're alluding to today. So right now, I don't think that there is a necessarily a straightforward process for offshore sequestration. That is the goal, and I think that we're in motion to, to get to that point. So in other words, we, we had some things that had to be cleared up on injection of CO2, the regulatory aspects of it offshore, but we are working very closely with our congressional delegation to, to really streamline and I think really develop a, a procedure for what that looks like offshore. So I think part of it is starts with what Bohm's doing on the analysis side, the agency coordination, but at the end of the day, hopefully in the next six months to a year, we'll have just a very straightforward process on what that looks like for a company that says, you know, if, if I want to model something like we're doing in Europe, which is, which is only offshore, you know, how, how do we go out and do sequestration in X? That's in federal waters. What's the agency coordination look like? What's the timeline for getting it? Do, do I need a permit? What does that permit look like? How long is it going to take? That's the level of detail that we're trying to get to with, with agency coordination, because I think right now there are several agencies who are working on that which as a private investor, that will probably give them pause, just not knowing, if, do I have to do this? Do I have to get a permit from this body? So we're trying to really develop a strategy on what that would look like for an actual project. Yeah, and I think I would just add, um, I would add to Jason, is as, com as companies are looking to do some of these offshore projects, the sooner rather than later you go to the regulatory bodies or the congressional agencies with questions or ideas, the faster things can change, hopefully. I mean, right now we see with Congress, things are just so hard to get through, and it's harder even since I left a year ago. But really, this idea of clarifying offshore sequestration came with an idea and was like, hey, we have a problem. And so knowing that the hydrogen hubs and knowing that the CCS hubs are really on a five-year timeline, which, like you said, may get extended, the sooner some of these more nuanced issues and those nuanced conversations can have, I think, the quicker maybe they can be resolved um, or solutions or streamlining um, efficiencies could happen. Yeah, I, I would like to add that, you know, we are meeting with different folks, and if there are people, if you have issues that you would like to meet with Bowman, provide input. I mean, the discussion simply about the size of the leashes is something when, when uh, the industry came in and talked to us and told us the scale of these projects, that it, you know, it didn't make any sense that you were going to have a three-mile three lease. So, I mean, those discussions are influencing how our rule making and our coordination will happen. Um, and enter into our draft rule that comes out uh, later this year. Other questions? Thank you again. Please join me in thanking our panel. And uh, Matt Fry, the floor is yours. Thank you. the end of the day I want to uh, thank all of our panelists and our moderators and uh, you the audience for being nice and uh, maintaining the schedule I thought the day went really well and I hope everybody learned a lot uh, at this point we'll adjourn for a bit and then we'll uh, move on to the social hour I like to think about the social hour is when you lock a bunch of people in a room and uh, talk about stuff all day then you turn them loose with cocktails and snacks and then the work really gets done so I am uh, interested in uh, what the conversations look like this afternoon or this evening upstairs and Jill I believe is going to tell us the logistics so uh, thanks again and I look forward to seeing you on a bit I know I'm the last person okay uh, the rooftop garden is located on the 16th floor, so just take the elevators and they will bring you right up there. Uh, Grace will be waiting for you for drink tickets as well right when you get onto the 16th floor. And I believe, given the weather outside, we will be inside, but the rooftop garden is available if you'd like to brave the rain for a little bit. Um, and then also tomorrow, we will be starting here, same place, at 8.30 a.m. will be breakfast, and then the first session starts at 9. So. Enjoy your evening. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>